into the stem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does everyone see that? That's edible then? This is really yeah, edible, take a yeah. Picture of that. This is pretty small. They tend to get a little bigger. You just eat They're it tasted? as is? No, all, all mushrooms need to be cooked. Oh. You know, really. mm -hmm. In yeah. salads, we eat them raw. Yeah, the mushrooms from the grocery store. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm i not a big fan of doing that. What is this, what is this one called? This is called, uh, it's a chanterelle, which is one of the most delicious mm -hmm. mushrooms. And this is called um, a cimarron yeah. with a distinct line where the gills meet the stem. Mm -hmm. Does everybody the see The gills that? meet the stem. Oh, yeah. See the gills yeah, yeah, meet yeah, yeah. the stem, and there's a line where you mm -hmm. could say that's where they end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one of the, the things that chanterelles do not have. They have gills, but the sh the, they, they fade through, yeah. right mm -hmm. into the stem. And that is non edible, right? right. I don't know this well, one. I'm moving into medicinals. That's so a medicinal? Yeah, medicinal and you herb? see it all mm -hmm. along in here. It has. Um, Called what? Partridge berry. Partridge, Partridge berry. berry. Yeah. So this this has um, how we would make the botanical distinction of this because one of the things when you look at plants you need to sort of look at them and say to yourself okay how how would I describe this plant to someone because that's the thing that's going to really make the difference in terms of uh, knowing that you have the right plant. So this one we would say its leaves are opposite. Right? They're mm -hmm. all in pairs. Mm -hmm. It's a vine. Mm -hmm. And it has this really distinctive white vein dividing mm -hmm. the leaves. Mm -hmm. mm. Does everyone see that? It's used as a tonic for the female reproductive system. Mm. It's a... Uh, it strengthens and regulates the function of the female reproductive system. So we use this for um, women who have menstrual uh, irregularities, a lack of menstrual periods, trouble getting pregnant, trouble maintaining a healthy pregnancy. As it's called. This right here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a, a distinctly different plant. This little cluster, but you see, it's right by the partridge berry, mm -hmm. right? But it does not, it's not a vine, right, it's upright, um, but it does have a white vein on its leaf. Another thing these two plants have in common is um, that they um, are both evergreen. So if you came out here in winter, you would still see both of these plants. This is Pipsisawa. Pipsisawa? <laughs> <laughs> yes, P-I-P-S-I-S-S-E-W-A. And as you might guess, that's an American Indian word, mm -hmm. right? Pipsisua aerial parts are used. This is a, has little eat. tiny flowers. It's already bloomed. anybody wants to get it. Now it's gone to seed. And um, Pipsisua is a tonic, so slow, long-term use mm -hmm. for their kidneys. And those are considered um, basil leaves because they grow at the base of the plant almost. Please point to them again. Right here's two big uh -huh. leaves, so two big pleated leaves right here. And, here and it's called? And it's called? Lady Slipper. Lady Slipper. That's called, um, this is called, it's, its botanical name is Prunella vulgaris. P-R-U-N-E-L-L-A-V-U-L-G-A-R-I-S. And whenever you hear a plant having as its botanical name the word vulgaris, it means common. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that, instead of giving it a specific name, it was just given that uh, that uh, species name because there's so much of it. This is actually a plant introduced from Europe, but it's a classic mint family plant. Um, some of you may know that one of the ways that mints are distinctive is they all have square stems. Mm -hmm. So when you feel the stem of a mint, yeah, it's, it's never it has one it has around. Edges to it, yeah. You can just sort of feel that. And oh, they're usually yeah. more towards the base than towards you the said top. Mint? Mint. Yeah, mm -hmm. the mint family. Everything in the mint family has opposite leaves, square stems, and they usually have their flowers arranged in what we call whorls or circles. It's not in that book, mm -hmm. by the way. Because it's a year. Those that's only native plants, and this is introduced. Oh, yeah. oh okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So do you see how these flowers are kind of arranged in circles? So we might look at this and say, oh, there's the flower, but it's really a collection of flowers, teeny tiny flowers. Cancer herb. A cancer. Anti-cancer herb. Yeah, a, a plant because Chinese medicine. Yeah, in Chinese, it's used in Chinese medicine. For? It's um for breaking up masses. The most phenomenal restorative for the liver function. Does it have to be old or can it be for young ones? Can be young. This is the Indian cucumber. Cucumber. I took some chefs out last spring. 
And I showed them this, and they tasted it, and they all went crazy over it. And they said, can we get 40 pounds of it, oh, yeah. <laughs> And I said, uh, you can't afford they need to get 40 pounds of it. Now, what is that? Solomon seal. Solomon? Oh, I've heard of that. So this is a good example of a rhizome, which okay. the rhizome is actually an underground stem. We'll have a photo. So you can see, this is how it was growing. Here's the leaf scar from last year, right here. No flat spot. And here's the bud for next year. Mm. Okay? So this plant is growing along like this. Mm. Right? When it first comes up in the spring, before the leaves fully emerge, it's edible as a wild green. It tastes like asparagus. Ooh. This was one of the main plants that the Cherokee used as a food. And what they would do with it is collect it after it flowered, so the flowers have fallen off and the berries have also fallen off, and it's starting to die back. Right? You see that? So that would be our signal that everything's going back into the ground. And this root, the Cherokee would take it and they would roast it in a in fire, like so they have coals, they would put it in the coals, let it roast. Then they would grind it and they would make it into a flower. F L O U R. And then they would use that flower as a thickening agent. Yellow root. Yellow root. It's distinct with its uh, its leaves. Yeah. Um, well, I'm going to show you a couple other things. About so, uh, woody stem comes out of the ground, right? So it's really not a, 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 an herb in the sense that it's not a succulent plant. It's got actually bark on it. And, and where the bark ends, that's where the flower, the leaves emerge. So that's one of its characteristics. When you scrape away the bark, you see this yellow inner pith, oh, yeah. which is very acrid. It's very cool and anti-inflammatory, particularly to the liver. And it has antifungal properties and antibacterial properties, which is basically what antimicrobial refers to. And this is phenomenal for oral stress, um, uh, stomach ulcers. So stomach ulcers are caused by um, H. pylori bacteria that gets in the ulcer and it perpetuates it. And this, drunk as a tea, will kill that bacteria and allow the stomach ulcers to... What's it called? Jewel weed. Jewel. And it's called jewel weed. What did we do? We're looking at jewel weed right here. And it's called jewel weed because of the way water beads up on its leaves. Do you see how that looks like a little garden? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And here's its little flower. It's just starting to bloom. Lovely little flowers that kind of dangle under mm -hmm. the leaves. And this is this plant is an annual, and what I how and what that means is it's really easy to uproot because annuals have no no significant root system. They only provide the plant with some stability and some nutrients through the root, but they don't ever store any nutrients in the root. So jewelweed, very succulent, fluid-filled plant. If you even just look at the stem, you find that there's all this liquid and juice in there. So think of the word vulnerable, but vulnerary. And a vulnerary is something that heals the skin. Mm. So this herb's main claim to fame is that it's soothing and anti-inflammatory to the skin, but it's also a little bit astringent. Mm. And that's why it's so famous for doing one particular thing. Anybody know? What's a stringent? Yeah. Astringent. It's it's it it's dry, yeah, it's, it, it's a astringent. It dries up fluids. Mm. Dries things up. How about for sunburn? Is it good for that? Poison ivy. Poison ivy. Oh, this is it. You have poison ivy. Phenomenal remedy because it addresses all the things that poison ivy does. Reduces the inflammation, heals the skin, and dries up the oil. What people used to use um, to um, false starter. Tinder starter. Tinder starter, and also um, to do like um, early photography and to do magic tricks. Yeah, like flash powder. You Lycopodium? Is it called lycopodium? Mm -hmm. Buckberries. Mm -hmm. You mean there's a mm. buckberry that people cultivate? Yeah, no, this is a this is a wild uh, like a man's Joe, name. Joe it's named after a man, Joe Pye. P Y E. P Y E. Joe Pye. Joe Pye. There's a big one. And there's a big one that usually gets about 12 to 14 feet tall. Excuse me. And Joe Pye is um, has two uses. The aerial parts are expectorant. They're for breaking up lung congestion and um, reducing fevers. 
and the roots are anti-lipid. Anyone remember what that was? Stone. Stone. Right. Stone. Dissolves kidney stones. So someone was asking me earlier about what you would do for kidney stones. You would do Pipsisua and the root of this. This is goldenrod, yeah. huh? Yeah, I love goldenrod. This is one of my favorite plants. It's got so many uses. It's got such a bad rap and it's not deserved. Um, so goldenrod, we use the aerial parts when it's in flower. This is wonderful for inflammation in the upper respiratory system. So seasonal allergies. So if you're someone who has seasonal allergies, wow. you drink a tea of this. It's going to reduce yeah. all the inflammation in your eye, you know, that scratchy throat, itchy eyes, runny nose, all of that. It's kind of like homeopathy. Yep. Does it cause it? No, it doesn't cause it. Ragweed causes it. Oh, thank you. And you can, let me just tell you something. This is, this is something that a lot of people misunderstand. The only plants that can cause an, a hay fever reaction are plants that have airborne pollen, that they're wind pollinated. So pine trees are wind pollinated. Ragweed is wind pollinated. Grasses are wind pollinated. Or the urinary tract, especially for cystitis. Um, both. All, both all, so the, all um, golden rods are used the same way. It's also very uh, healing to the skin, so you can make a skin salve out of the same one This food. one is rose hips here with these compound leaves. Well, they are rose hips. But don't get confused because sticking out in between them are elderberries. Okay? So you can see the difference. Yeah. Okay, so you can see the difference between the two of these, right? Yeah. Very different. Which is basically the seed ovary of the flower that's swelling up. These are going to turn dark red. Uh, the colder, the farther we go into the fall. After a few frosts, they get very tart. And that's when the ascorbic acid is the highest in them. And that's what makes them a good source of vitamin C. If you have different kinds of roses, the hip size is going to vary depending on the rose. So these are very, very small. When I'm out walking in the winter, I pick these and just eat them as a source of vitamin berries. Elderberry. Elderberry. And they're, they're not ripe. <coughs> they're going to be purple. They're going to look like a blueberry when they're ripe.